our institute, um, the GIZ Nexus platform dialogues. And so I just want to spend a couple of minutes just talking about uh, what we're going to do today. He has, he has the um, focus on disaster resilience. And we have four excellent speakers. I'll introduce them um, as they come up. They'll each have 15 minutes. And then we'll spend the last 20 or 30 minutes on open discussion. I want to challenge you guys to be thinking about this because the series is focused around solutions. You know, Nexus is a nice concept. And you've, you've probably all seen this type of framework where we see the integration of these key resources, almost any activity. And the question is how we use this framework to make better decisions and solve the problems, especially in Africa, where there are, is obviously acute water energy and food insecurities. Um, and so we have developed this water energy food nexus initiative in Africa. There's the website. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to participate, become a member. We have monthly newsletters and other activities where we collaborate with those other institutions on Nexus activities. So today's webinar is, is sort of focused on these issues of disasters, you know, whether they're natural disasters or related to man-made. We think of, you know, the, the different typologies of disasters, which can be sort of at a local level where you have flooding or droughts, and then you they can expand into catastrophes, which can affect um, you know bigger areas. And climate change is one of the things we think about catastrophes, nuclear war, um, asteroids. Those are kind of big things that also might have existential risks. And obviously, there's a lower probability of these bigger events. And most commonly, we think about you know these disasters like flooding, drought, fires earthquakes and, and things like that. But you know, when, when they escalate and compound, they can lead to more severe in scope and problematic for, for humans in general. So I just want to set, when we think about disasters, we want to think about them at different scales and impacts on, on people. And especially what we want to talk about today is, is the impact on water energy food. And, and so in Africa, obviously, we're going to hear from speakers about droughts, flooding, water, fires, and other urban and rural issues. And then again, from the solution side, we want to be more resilient. You know, that word is thrown around a lot, but it's, it's, it's basically how we can adapt and anticipate these types of disasters. So with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing. And I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. We're just going to go in order here. And the first speaker is Arthur Chapman. Um, he's an independent consultant in risk assessment, uh, focusing on hydro hydrology and water matters, climate change adaptation and impacts on agriculture, food security, human health, and energy production. So he covers the waterfront. Uh, he's also concerned with the frequency and intensity of extreme events, right, these disasters. He has a Master of Science in Hydrology and has 31 years of professional experience. He works mo mostly in the Southern Africa SADAC states, but has consulted elsewhere in places like Uruguay, Uganda, and Cameroon. Um, so Arthur, please share your screen. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. That's it. Right, thanks. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to open this up to full screen. Yeah, click right, right there. Can you see that? Right, uh, thanks, uh, Mike, for that uh, introduction. So without further ado, I will get going here. Okay, so um, this presentation, I'm just going to give a bit of background. Presentation gives a very broad outline of some of the issues in the water energy food nexus. Okay, these things have uh, many nuances and, um, and they are very detailed. So I'm not going to go into all of that, but it's just to give you a flavor of uh, how some of these things play out. I'm going to use a few examples. And we can look at some of the ways they um, present themselves. So what we have, of course, are growing populations and the demand and 
uh, for food and energy is increasing against uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, um, worsening, as it were, uh, resource, maybe. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's fair to say that drought uh, reduces water supplies to both agriculture and water um, and power production. And drought, if we look at the numbers, affects more people in Africa than any other natural hazard. And anyway, that's true in Southern Africa. So, uh, so that is uh, certainly indicates where drought is a disaster will certainly have a massive influence on both energy supplies and food production. What we also know is that Africa in large, by and large, is, is heavily dependent on hydropower and is very short of power at the same time. So you can understand there's this desperate need for more uh, power production. But the problem is that this ideal, if we consider the um, energy food uh, and water nexus is that securing the energy and the food and, and, and let's not forget this part, the ecological function with that so same water can and is problematical. Okay, and we'll discuss some of these things. So, so in, in doing so, um, it can also be, uh, uh, bring strong reactions for people who, who tend to think of when we present these rather um, international examples as uh, treading on other people's turf, as it were, in terms of how national, uh, how nations see themselves and where they fit into the picture. And most of this is because of just the geographical nature of international rivers. So first of all, and I think we've sort of seen a, a, how this, part of how this may play out, the transboundary issues. And for this one, I'm going to touch lightly on the G3 uh, dam in Ethiopia, uh, um, and the Zambezi, um, Botswana, Panda Matenga abstraction or potential uh, project, okay? One's been built, the other is uh, still um, in consideration. And then I'll turn to um, another part of it. So this is the national component, what I call the internal development competition or paradigm. And then I'll just go through briefly the Mtera Kadatu hydropower system, and then two examples from South Africa, which may interest people, and then we'll come to some broad conclusions. So here is uh, the, the, the Jeep 3 hydropower system. It's located on the Omo River. It's installed capacity as 1,870 megawatts, 1.8, nearly 1.9 gig um, megawatts, a, a, a big, uh, installation by any means. Uh, annual uh, production about 6,500 gigawatt hours. It's already been completed and has been filling. It has an installed capacity which increases the hydropower production of Ethiopia by 243%. That is a massive amount uh, and you can think of what that's going to do to the local economy and and then in terms of total annual power production in Ethiopia it increases that by 57%. So this is a, a big jump in uh, power production in Ethiopia. So let us also consider that Ethiopia has the second highest hydropower potential on the African continent after Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay, so Ethiopia, Ethiopia has, is an upland nation and has uh, quite substantial water resources. So the, the net effect of this, though, is that um, the, the uplands there sit primarily in uh, Ethiopia and the river, the Omo River, flows into to Lake Turkana. Uh, so, so there's a sort of certain level of interference with the natural flow cycle. So what we have seen already is there's been a drop in the annual flooding, and this changes the sediment fertilization effects because a lot of that has been caught already in the dam. While it was infilling, it reduced the flows to Lake Turkana, okay, so it dropped uh, at least temporarily the, the levels of the lake. Nevertheless, what is also planned is a large-scale irrigation up, uh, below the dam, but upstream of Lake Turkana. So there's a, a, certainly a um, big agricultural production planned. And uh, 
what what we've got to consider here potentially is this whole change in ecological function of that river system and up to 500,000 people potentially being affected in one way or another. And just to say that also another dam is also uh, being planned, was under construction below Jeep 3, which is a Koi, Koisha Dam. So it's also on the Omo River. Okay, so that was one, that's an international one. Another one we're considering and looking at is the potential for drawing water off the Zambezi um, Chobi uh, confluence at Kasani, which is in the top uh, right hand picture. Um, sorry, the top of your, your picture there. And then leading this water about 495 million cubic meters down into Botswana, which of course, as we know, is quite arid. And uh, first of all, to develop um, an irrigation scheme at a place called Panda Matenga. And also passing some of that water down what they call the north-south carrier to a place near Salibi Pekwe and then onto Khaburon. So we know, of course, that, uh, as I said, Botswana is a dry country, very dry, and would do well to obtain more water. So far, um, a whole lot of planning and costings have been done, but um, and was anticipated by 2020, but to date, there's no sign of anything occurring there. Now, part of the problem is that uh, ZAMCOM, which is, uh, is, is the Zambezi River Basin Commission set up to uh, incorporate all eight riparian states as, um, is, is put together to, to ratify this, but has not been fully ratified. And part of that, of course, is that uh, the competition comes in here, especially around the power production. And both Zambia and Zimbabwe are desperately dependent, as it were, on power production from Kariba. And we know that in recent times that uh, the, the dam has dropped uh, such because of, of intense droughts to levels where powers had to be curtailed. Okay, so the feed through, of course, of this where, where Zambia and Zimbabwe get most of their power from hydropower production is that the, this conflict of interest starts to arise because the, the, um, the draw, the offtake off will be above Kariba Dam. Okay, so so one can sense that there's this reluctance to start sharing out water when it could uh, make a life more difficult in terms of power production. And that's just a, a view um, of Victoria Falls uh, in, during an intensely dry season, a recent drought. Um, the, this, this picture can be a bit misleading because um, behind the, the camera, there's a um, certain amount of water coming over the falls, but it can look spectacularly dry during a drought in the upper catchments of the Zambezi. So the point around here is that riparian states are cautious over committing withdrawals upstream, which is critical of hydropower infrastructure. And when you bring in multiple partners, national partners, of course, the, the, um, the, the different uh, countries involved start to um, try to slow things down. So here we go to an internal development um, problem. And uh, uh, this is one which really speaks to me to be the heart of the water energy uh, food nexus, because to me, this is M is really emblematic of the problem. And this is Terra Kadatu hydropower scheme in Tanzania, uh, which was the, the, it was built starting in 1970 and was completed in uh, 1998, I think, or 88. Nevertheless, the two passes, the two hydropower schemes here, generators, 200 megawatt on Kadatu Dam and 80 megawatts on Terra uh, Dam. And this supplies 50% of all hydropower uh, in Tanzania, of all, all their hydropower resources. So the players here are the energy consumers, industrial, commercial, and domestic. And, and, uh, and there are others which are upstream farmers 
and irrigators. Now, it turns out that during times of intense drought, there's been an energy shortfall in Tanzania, and there's had to be a curtailment of hydropower production, which of course has affected the economy. So you can see immediately uh, where, how this is, uh, system is highly susceptible to drought. And the problem, of course, is that these problems of water usage upstream and the sensitivity of the Mtera Dam to, um, to water abstraction by uh, users has, has known when it was built, but these things did not sort of um, take, will come into the planning, as it were, of how, how the whole structure would work. So there's just a quick outline. Uh, the green areas on Sangu, Usangu uh, wetlands, where you have rice farmers in there, and then uh, downstream on the Great Ruaha River um, to the Mtera Dam. So there's a certain amount of water abstraction going on there. And um, from Mtera Dam, which is a storage dam which feeds Kedati, which which does not have a large uh, supply. Nevertheless, this Intera Dam is used to control the amount of water coming through to uh, Kidatu system. So over the last the, over the last thirty years, there have been seven major droughts, and these have reduced uh, power uh, in the whole system. So the 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 response has been by government to tell the irrigators that they are to stop irrigating, okay, which affects um, in, in one part of the system between eight and 10,000 rice and other farmers. So in the system, I think it's fair to say that uh, the uh, power users are going to have uh, more power as it were than the farmers. So the takeaway, um, Take away message here is that. Oh, a couple more minutes, okay. Okay, I better get going. All right. Um, this marginal nature has been known for a long time. Okay, here's a South African uh, example: coal mining um, in the Pumalanga High Felt, where the major coal fields are. Most of the power in South Africa comes from hydrothermal power supplied by coal fields. And the problem here is that uh, these coal fields are located in the grassland catchments where um, much of the, um, uh, is, is a large hydro, uh, sorry, not hydropower, water resources. So here's an example. You see um, this uh, wet, um, not wetland, but just grassland. And in the back, you have mine dumps and what you see here is these, um, the Mpumalanga High Felt, not only is the upland catchment for the Vaal River, which supplies water to Johannesburg, but it's, uh, the, these coal fields are located right in the middle of that. And then after 2004, there was a massive jump in prospecting allocations or applications, basically to cover the whole area of that upland grassland, which supplies the water. So what I'm sort of pointing out here is that uh, these coal fields are located in the uh, catchments. So much of it, if you convert it to coal mining, you've got a massive problem, first of all, of, of abstraction of water. You've got a huge problem of acid mine drainage. Uh, unrehabilitated mine spoils. So we can see an image of that, uh, which is illegal. So you've got a water resource problem. And as I said, acid mine drainage, it's highly toxic. You can't use it for irrigation. Okay, um, all right, just one more example. Uh, another one is what we call the Buchelberg irrigation scheme located on the Orange River. It supplies water through a canal uh, for an area of 7,560 thereabouts hectares of irrigated water. We must say that it is um, wasteful of water as well. It's in very old. But uh, recently, because South Africa has a big um, uh, hydro, uh, rather energy shortfall as well, there was an idea of 
installing a 10 megawatt installation uh, at Buchelberg Dam. But the problem is that uh, some of the design has not been considered. And you see here, basically, a powerhouse was installed on the right bank of this river on the orange. You see left bank irrigation canal. And basically, to keep this running because of the type of the design, uh, th there was an idea that the, the sluices at the bottom of the dam, which would release the sediment, um, would be closed. But the problem with this, of course, is that it threatens the irrigation canal on the left bank. So uh, actually, in the end, uh, nothing happened. So, so um, basically, that was brought in because of an environmental impact assessment was required, and we had a, had a look at, at this sediment problem. So in the end, at conclusions, um, if, if we look across the world, 650 odd medium to large dams on construction, and these are located as it were exposed to El Nino, possibly, which could be exposed to drought. So what we're saying, well, I'm saying here is that the water energy food issues will increase, especially where these droughts intensify. So uh, the question is, are we asking um, which will win out, energy or food? And uh, we've got to question that. So some of the possible solutions, and I think at a very broad level, we've got to have better agreements, active basin commissions where people get together and make decisions, we've got to have better uh, strategic and environmental impact assessments. So we understand all of the, uh, the nuances of each uh, installation. We've got to have agreed operating rules about how these uh, work. And uh, there's got to be a pol better policy environment and, and committed government to understand how these work and make sure that all of these things work together. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Arthur, for setting the stage, so to speak, um, talking about some examples and, and the difficult idea of, of looking at the, the nexus of these resources and using hydropower as, as a potentially a solution for energy and water needs and, and irrigation, but, but again, maybe compounding those disasters, uh, especially when there's droughts, which can lead to things like famines and so on. So I'm gonna move on to our next speaker um, on the list, and that's Francesco uh, O'Hanlon. She's a postdoc researcher at the University of Cambridge studying water innovation for use in the global south. In 2017, she set up BlueTap, which is a social enterprise that is looking at developing water purifying solutions for users in low income and emerging economies. Francesca founded BlueTap after working for the charity Medicine Sans Frontiers for two years in South Sudan and the Central African Republic, where she coordinated the water supply for emergencies. So she's, she's been right in the middle of these situations. She recently completed a PhD at the University of Cambridge, and her research is looking at water harvesting for improving water food security and climate resilience in Uganda. She's also won the National Geographic Explorers Award for her work with BlueTap and for her PhD on climate resilience and water security. Thanks for joining us, Francisco, and I'll let you share your screen. Go ahead. There we go. Uh, is that looking good? Yes, thank you. Great. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is my uh, PhD research, which uh, I carried out between 2017 and 2020. Um, a bit of context. As Mike said, um, prior to beginning my PhD, I worked for MSF, which is Doctors Without Borders. Um, I was working in Central Africa Republic and South Sudan. And this was actually at the time, this was 2015, 2016. Um, and in 2015, my job was to provide emergency healthcare centers with water and sanitation uh, services. So I was a, a water and sanitation engineer. Um, and as part of my job, I was taking testimonies from local communities about how the conflict, there's conflict in the country, how the conflict was affecting quality of life. Um, 
And we were getting messages coming out again and again that, of course, the conflict was having an incredible effect on quality of life, but also weather patterns and shifts in weather patterns were having a massive effect on food security. So a lot of uh, people that I interviewed had never actually heard of any of the uh, kind of narrative around climate change. There was really poor access to education in the communities I was interviewing. But people were saying that there had been a significant shift in rainfall patterns. And what this meant was that certain crops just wouldn't grow. They wouldn't grow because they would only grow when rains fell when they typically were expected. And actually, as a result of this, in 2017, the UN declared uh, the first famine in six years uh, in South Sudan. And principally, that was put down to the conflict, but it was noted that climate change was having an impact on uh, the famine. Um, so as a result of this, I, I wanted to carry out some research to really understand, obviously, I'm an engineer and engineers always want to find solutions. I wanted to find out what solutions we could implement in the region to help protect against this climate unpredictability. Um, so I began my PhD at Cambridge um, answering some of the, the questions. So, so the main questions were, how can rainwater harvesting contribute to better water security? Um, what does water security actually mean in this context? And I, I particularly wanted to focus on a community scale rather than a transboundary scale. Um, and then broadly in East Africa, um, uptake of rainwater harvesting is, is far below targets that have been set by the United Nations. So I wanted to understand why this is. And actually a long time ago, I'd been working in Mexico and rainwater harvesting in Mexico is quite well adopted there. But one of the challenges is that they only have a short three month rainy season in Mexico. So you have to harvest a lot of water and store it for the other nine months. Whereas in the East Africa region where I was working and researching, um, you have two a dual rainy season. So it, it seemed to me perfect for rainwater harvesting. So why weren't more people using it? And that's what I set out to answer. Um, so first what I did is I, I developed a, a definition and an understanding of what water security is. So what you can see here, this is a, a water security framework. Now, for me, the reason I'm interested in describing the human water relationship in terms of water security, rather than um, just in terms of the physical fundamental things like quality, availability and quantity, it's because, you know, I really have a belief as a water engineer and from my experience with MSF that that water is the linchpin to all socioeconomic development. So um, with good water, you can get multiple, multiple social benefits, not just I've got a clean glass of water, that's it, I've got good health. There's other benefits such as if you have water um, to generate livelihoods, um, it improves quality of life for women. Uh, they're spending less time going to collect water, these things. Um, so if you look at the framework here, it, it, it describes 10 goals that um, for a, a community to be water secure, water services should meet these goals. So of course, water services should provide water of acceptable quality. And actually, the interesting thing about quality is, is you really have to ask the question, um, who is the quality of the water acceptable to? You know, it's great to have water that meets WHO and national standards. But if the users don't like the taste, you know, say it's chlorinated or overchlorinated, then then there's no point if, because people won't drink it. They'll then choose to go to unprotected water sources. So acceptable quality to users. Water needs to be available year round. And of course, one of the biggest drawbacks with rainwater harvesting is it, it just cannot, unless implemented very specifically, it cannot provide water year round. It's very, very dependent on rainfall. It has to, you have to have enough water. Um, but I also believe that water services should be resilient to climate change. So what I mean by this is um, almost counterintuitively, say we take communities in the UK, uh, we are totally reliant on centralized water. And that water never stops. But if it were to stop, there'd be total chaos. You know, there'd be queues at shops. Whereas when you get to some lower income countries, like where I was working in Uganda and South Sudan, often homeowners and domestic users and agricultural users, they have multiple sources of water supply. And that's actually a good thing because it means that if one fails, you have a backup. So building redundancy into water supply is very good. And and rainwater harvesting, when paired with a centralized water supply or a borehole access, um, actually can provide resilience to climate unpredictability. Of course, these services need to be affordable. So um, one of the topics I grappled with was, uh, should water be free? And, and, and some of the findings from my research was that um, making water services free actually undermines the quality of delivery. So there should be a small charge to um, receive water and have water provided because it means that the service is more likely to be good 
and you're more likely to get good quality water and water that doesn't have interruptions. But the affordability is a very important component. Um, and then I, I looked at a few other um, kind of characteristics of what water secure services are, such as they should be able to be maintained over the long term. So um, often you saw, I saw in the communities where I was working, um, you can have uh, fantastic technological solutions, um, but when one component breaks, the service just can't be maintained because you have to order that component from Amsterdam and you know that's impossible to get that delivered in a in a reasonable time frame so 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 building capacity among communities to maintain water services and making sure that the technology to repair these services is embedded in the community is incredibly important so the next thing i did uh, I, I used a mixed method approach to understand how rainwater harvesting was co contributing to water security so um water quality tests using del agua kits site assessments photos focus groups, stakeholder interviews, you know, a really comprehensive uh, understanding of what the water security was like in, in the communities I visited. Um, so my case study area, so I initially couldn't go back to South Sudan to, um, to carry out the case studies uh, because of the conflict, because it was deemed uh, too dangerous. Um, so I chose to partner with uh, the Kigezi DSCs and Water Sanitation Project, um, which is based in Southwest Uganda. And what I wanted to do, actually, is I wanted to compare uh, the water security of an urban community and a rural community, because by and large, the majority of people that don't have access to good water uh, are rural populations. And actually, one of the questions I had was, why would communities in an urban environment who have access to centralized water supply, why would they choose to adopt rainwater harvesting? Surely, if you had, you know, water coming out of your tap and home in your house, that would be enough. But it wasn't. Uh, and so that's one of the questions that I'll answer in a few slides. Um, in the rural community, it was a community that was very remote. And um, they had a very interesting uh, sort of geographic situation in that the community used to be based down by uh, the river. So it is quite a hilly area. And in, sort of 20 years ago, the community was all based on the riverside, of course, so they had access to water. And actually, um, potentially because of climate change, uh, landslides had got worse and worse, and there'd been quite a few significant landslides that had wiped the community out, killed many people. And as a result, the community relocated to the top of the hillside, but it meant that their nearest water source, the river, was a five kilometer walk there and back down a very, very steep hill. So they didn't have any other access to water, so they decided to adopt rainwater harvesting. So it was a really interesting uh, situation. In both the communities, I think it's important to note that neither of them were water stressed. And actually, um, what's fascinating about this region of Southwest Uganda is it, very, it's almost tropical uh, kind of uh, weather pattern. So they have this biannual rainy season. So March, April, May, strong rainfalls, and October, November, December, there's strong rainfall as well. And then the dry period or the drought is in June, July, August, and sort of January, February time. So there is there is significant rainfall in the region, but the community is water insecure. Um, because of a lack of infrastructure to provide good water. So, so that's something else I quite like to, about the term water security is it encompasses um, sort of social, political um, uh, um, factors into whether water is being uh, adequately provided to populations. So some of the results. Um, so first in the rural community, what I wanted to know is what drove people to adopt rainwater harvesting? When was it done well? And what stopped people adopting it? Because ultimately, you know, I wanted to understand how we could get more people using it because it, it is a fantastic solution to build climate resilience. So some of the drivers, um, it was really important that there was an NGO in the region that was um, partially funding the rainwater harvesting systems, but also um, adopting this really interesting model. So rather than building the rainwater harvesting systems themselves, they would train predominantly women in the communities to build the systems and then the women could um, build systems for other customers in the community and this meant they, they generated this self-supply model they, they they built capacity in in the community and also it meant that um some of the women could generate an income for themselves which was incredibly important so that was a fantastic driver and um, of course um the community decided to adopt rainwater harvesting because it really it was a case of there wasn't much other choice they had some gravity feed systems um, but one of the drivers to adopt it is a lot of people actually wanted to have water on site in their houses rather than having to go to a shared water point. And that wasn't because the shared water point um, wasn't, you know, delivered very well. It was principally because most of the um, most of the homeowners in the assessments, the assessment had 20 homeowners uh, in each community. Um, they had a small farm on site, so either um, cattle and animals or crops, and they needed water to, um, you know, keep the, the these farms running. 
And that was one of the really big drivers. And actually, the presence of water meant that people had the capacity to generate some income. And there were even some um, stakeholders in the study who would sell water. Um, so we're selling water to um, construction companies who were, who were using it for concrete uh, production in the, in the area. So, so the obvious massive barriers to rainwater harvesting adoption in the region is the high capital cost. Um, yeah, I think so a 4,000 litre system costs about $900. Um, and the monthly wage in the region is, is far, far less than that. So um, getting access to the capital cost for rainwater harvesting is always going to be a big barrier in this region. And because of that, I think it, it is um, essential that the government provides subsidies or NGOs provide subsidies and, and incentives to get people to adopt rainwater harvesting. Um, one of the big barriers, obviously, with rainwater harvesting, and one of my main suggestions is that it is implemented in partnership with other water sources, is unless you put into place really good conservation practices, um, you are never going to have enough water for the whole of the year. So conservation practices are essential, but also making sure the tank is sized correctly for the roof. So if you've got a very big roof, you can uh, do some calculations to work out what size of tank you can, uh, you can have for that kind of water supply, that catchment area. Um, so this is just a, a photo we've got here. This is one of the typical tanks you've got in the rural community. Uh, and what the water quality test demonstrated was that at 80% of the sites, the quality was good. And you can see it's fascinating because even this filtration system, it's just a bowl with holes cut out of it. It's very rudimentary. But what's fantastic about it is it's effective at filtering bacteria, well, filtering sediment at least, uh, probably not to the extent of bacteria and pathogens. But it's effective at filtering sediment and it's locally available and can be repaired locally. So it meant that every single one of the sites that I visited had this installed. Whereas if you had something more sophisticated that was an import, it likely would get clogged and break and it wouldn't be replaced. So I think local solutions are incredibly important and incredibly affordable as well, bringing down that cost. And then, uh, Sorry. yeah, okay. no, that's totally fine. So just some findings from the urban community. Uh, do you remember before I asked that question, why if you had centralized water, would you adopt rainwater harvesting? And what was fascinating about the findings here was that it was actually typically because of a mistrust of the centralized water supply. So often people would find when they boil the water, it would go brown, indicating poor quality. Um, but also, uh, even though the prices of rainwater harvesting over a 10-year period were comparable to the prices of municipal water, um, customers did not feel that they trusted the national water to um, provide the service that they wanted and also to spend money on repairing the service. So actually ownership, um, owning their own water supply, that was a real significant driver for um, the stakeholders in, from the urban community. Um, and they had good water quality at 70% of the site, so it was comparable to uh, the rural community users. And just finally, uh, some recommendations. So I, I think rainwater harvesting um, can provide one tool in a suite of solutions to build climate resilience. It can help particularly with this climate unpredictability. If, if the rainfall isn't falling exactly when you need it, if you can capture it and store it, then it can be used to um, for a little for small scale irrigation and it can help with crop growth. That has to be partnered with diversification of crops as well though. Um, and um, on the water security side, going back to the beginning, using this framework, I think it's incredibly important to um, use a framing of water security and, and the framework is actually available for practitioners now. It's incredibly important to use this framing because it helps practitioners to think not only just about the delivery of water, is there enough, is it good enough, is it safe to drink, but also about the other impacts of water access. Are women having more time to work? Are children getting more time for education? Are the services creating resilience to future climate unpredictability? So it provides a fantastic framework to think about how water is really the linchpin of socioeconomic development and achieving not just SDG 6, but all of the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesca. That was great to case study of showing another solution, rainwater harvesting in, in, in these potential uh, disaster situations and solutions for water energy food systems. So now we're gonna move on to Alberto Francelio. Uh, he's the project manager and researcher for Piri Piri University. I don't know how many of you have years heard about it. The secretariat is based at Stellenbosch University. It's focused on disaster resilience. Um, um, Alberto is a member of the African Union's Youth Advisory Board for Disaster Risk Reduction. So what he's going to talk about today is actually, we've, we've heard from Francisco about urban rural. He's going to focus more on um, urban issues, low-income households in Cape Town, understand factors which influence their 
energy choices and the risk facing those households and communities. He's also going to briefly introduce Peri Peri University Network, which is a consortium of 12 African universities on disaster risk education, research, and advocacy across the continent. I'll let, I'll let him expand on that. Thank you, Alberta. Go ahead. You've muted. Ah, apologies. Sorry. Always forget when one um, does presentations that all your functions kind of shift around a little bit. That what's at the bottom it turns up at the top of the screen. So thank you very much. I hope everyone can see uh, my slides. Is is that okay? Yes. Great. Perfect. Well, thank you again very much, Michael. And um, also, thank you very much, Francesca. I think that was a fantastic uh, presentation you did just now, as well as Arthur's at the beginning. Uh, Definitely got lots of questions for you guys afterwards. But uh, essentially, um, hello everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. I'm Alberto Franciulli from Stellenbosch University. And today I'll be talking to you a little bit, hopefully related to the water energy food nexus is about energy related risks, uh, particularly the implications for fire risk and how that affects resilience amongst low income settlements in Cape Town, South Africa. So just a brief introduction to myself and the organization I work for. I work for an organization called Peri Peri U. It's a consortium of 12 African universities that's focused on enhancing disaster risk reduction across the continent. Uh, I'm based at Stellenbosch University, which acts as our secretariat, but our partners range from uh, Antanarivo and Madagascar in the south to Algiers in the north. So we have four main activities which we conduct um, which we carry out the, the peri peri objectives, and that is uh, enhancing capacity building and training through our various postgraduate and undergraduate programs. Uh, we conduct research and knowledge generation, particularly at trying to understand localized uh, risks, particularly those at subnational level, to understand how we can try and assist communities and assist uh, guiding policy of government. Then, of course, we, we do a lot of community outreach um, to try and reduce vulnerability and enhance resilience of those, um, those at greatest risk. Then we also conduct a lot of strategic engagement and advocacy on behalf of higher education, disaster risk capacity building and research across the continent as well as internationally as well. So without further ado, I want to talk a little bit more about my, my, my research that I've been doing for a couple of years now, looking at sort of energy related issues in the city of Cape Town and what implications it has for fire risk. So to provide a little bit of a context, Fire is a major, major issue uh, amongst low-income households across South Africa, but particularly in the major metropolises such as Johannesburg and Cape Town. Uh, in particular, densely populated and formal sediments. Um, these sediments are made up of houses, um, which are sort of wood and tin and shacks, uh, very, very close together, are at greatest risk due to the, the flammable nature of these dwellings, but also due to minimal um, town and urban planning, as well as lack of emergency roads. Such fires, uh, such urban fires can vary in magnitude and impacts from maybe a, a single fire incident, maybe consuming one or two dwellings, or in the event of what happened in Imizamo Yetu, a township in Cape Town, in which over 5,000 people were made homeless in less than an hour due to a fire that ravaged across the settlement, destroying some 600 to 700 homes. The numbers, it's very difficult to tell these numbers because of the informality of these sort of settlements. But as you can see, the, the destruction is, is incredible. So now it's it's commonly been attributed that these, these urban fire risks, these the, the cause of this is from has this traditional and formal energy sources, flame-based energy such as kerosene and candles, etc. And it's been a huge endeavor of the city of Cape Town to try and curb on this. And so some of the key strategies have been including uh, the formalization of households and communities, so trying to turn um, wooden and, and tin dwellings into brick and mortar style houses with greater spacing in between them, better urban planning and service provision, especially in the sense of creating access roads for emergency vehicles to, to come. But probably one of the flagship projects of the city of Cape Town has been trying to address issues of energy inequality in the city. Uh, and certainly you're trying to increase people's access to modern and safe forms of energy. Um, in the picture at the bottom right is that you can see some of the state um, state developed housing there. And the, the funny devices you might see are actually solar water geysers to try and provide um, you know, hot water through renewable energy sources to households to try and reduce their costs and to provide them with access to hot water. So now, as I was saying, energy inequality has been a huge issue in South Africa. In the 1990s, towards the end of the apartheid government, only 30 to 35% of households across the country actually had access to energy. And 
around about 2018 or so, we've seen this number jump up to about 80 to 85. And, and K the city of Cape Town has been very proud to brag that over 95% of households across the city now have access to electricity. And therefore, we are winning the battle against urban fire risk as well as energy inequality. However, we've been finding this has not really been the case as much because through our interactions in a, various of the, in, in a variety of the communities we work in, as well as other research done by other partners, we found that the majority of low-income households continue to utilize non-electric energy sources on a regular basis to meet their energy needs. As a result, urban fire risk remains a major problem and even an increasing issue across communities. And now there's even increasing reports of fires caused by faulty or inform informal electrical connections. So today we're going to be dis discussing and maybe exploring a little bit of the reasons why this is the case. Why, what is causing these, these major, in these, these continuing energy inequalities and how is this, what kind of implications this has for fire risk and also what kind of resilience issues uh, can we see in this process? So looking at household energy strategies, we find that throughout our research is that electricity remains the predominant energy source across household, or at least the most preferred energy option. It's used for things such as lighting, for cooking, refrigeration, uh, things like entertainment, such as powering radios, televisions, computers, etc., but also for home run businesses, such as internet cafes, salons, uh, eateries, etc. However, as mentioned before, the majority of households continue to frequently employ non-electric energy sources to meet their needs. We found that up to 67.2% of households utilize this energy stacking approach, which is combining modern energy sources such as electricity and LPG gas with traditional or what is known as transitional energy sources such as coal, paraffin, candles, and even charcoal, and sometimes even firewood, which is considered a more primitive energy source. So to try and understand some of these different energy sources which are commonly utilized amongst our communities, paraffin and kerosene is the most widely utilized energy source amongst low income communities. It's for many people, they consider it the big three because with a single paraffin stove, you can cook food, you can boil water, you can heat up your dwelling and in the most dire instances, you can even use it to provide lighting for your, for your dwelling as well. Uh, candles, I think are very self-explanatory. I think everyone has used a candle at least once in their lifetime either for um, because you've had no power or for maybe a romantic setting, whichever the case. And then with regards to things like firewood and coals, uh, firewood is not as commonly utilized in the coastal regions of South Africa, or firewood and coal. Um, in the northern parts of South Africa, such as what um, Arthur was talking about a little bit earlier, is that we have major coal mining fields. So Francisco, we lost you froze. Apologies for that, everyone. I hope you can come back on in a minute. I guess he had an energy problem in Cape Town. So I think we, um, we lost Alberto. He was talking about household energy and he was going to get into some of the disaster issues related to the fire. Oh, there you are. You muted again. Sorry, Mike, I must have lost some connection there for a second. Uh, apologies about that. Um, where did you lose me at? Okay. Um, yeah, you got about three or four minutes. So I think we lost you when you were talking about, um, you know, the types of fuels. Um, and so it, if you can get to the fire issues and and then wrap up, that'll be great. Okay, sure. I'll very quickly go through it. But looking at some of the reasons of, say, the utilization of certain energy sources, such as, such as kerosene and, and candles, they're, they're two major constraining factors. One is economic and the other is physical. So with regards to sort of an economic constraining factor, um, the majority of low-income households are highly energy impoverished, using over 20% of their household income to try and meet energy needs. And of course, South Africa, what couples with this issue is that South Africa has some of the most expensive electricity rates in the world um, due to our ailing and updating infrastructure, which our governments have been trying to do for the last couple of decades or so. But also one of the other issues, which I certainly took for granted while doing this research, is that when it looks at uh, certain energy sources, such as paraffin versus electric electricity for things such as cooking, boiling water and heating, um, a, fifth, a, a sort of a $20 to $30 kerosene uh, stove can do cooking, it can cook your food, boil your water, um, heat up your home 
Uh, whilst if you wanted to do those all separately, if you want to do that electricity, you'd have to buy three separate um, appliances to do that, an electric oven, an electric kettle, an electric stove, which would cost several hundred more dollars to do. And also another factor which I wasn't able to mention there is that kerosene is also considered a highly social fuel in the sense that people, neighbors will commonly go to one another and ask, can I please borrow a cup of kerosene or paraffin, where they would literally pour the paraffin into these cups and share amongst neighbors like one would share milk or tea or something or coffee. And it's something that you just can't really do with electricity, especially when the power's out, you can't say, can I borrow a cup full of electricity? So this is some of the reasons why things like candles and paraffin and even firewood to a certain degree are still highly utilized amongst these different communities. But also with regards to things such as um, saving electricity for unique services, such as refrigeration or entertainment, such as television or for your businesses. So people would much rather use these more hazardous energy sources to try and power or to try and provide power towards essential services such as food or cooking food, boiling water, and uh, provide, keeping themselves warm in the winter, especially. Looking at physical accessibility, um, many, many parts of South Africa, even though they tout um, great accessibility to electricity, it's not always formally given. It's sometimes used, they're informal connections which are used to power households and settlements, which are highly dangerous, even though they makes it more accessible. But this also, reduces the the potential of the irregularity well it makes electricity access more irregular more prone to tripping overloading and hence becoming very dangerous but um sorry i do know my time is limited so i'm going to rush through um so looking at the majority of dwelling fires caused by non-electrical energy sources this is still very much the case across south africa we're finding that across the, the region that particularly with regards to accidents related to paraffin stoves remain highly problematic but it's actually been very interesting to find is that we found that the majority of household fires occur, uh, about 60% of all household fires in the city of Cape Town occur late on Saturday night and early on Sunday morning when people come home from parties or from bars, etc., in perhaps an intoxicated state. And what they try and do is that they'll cook afterwards in the early hours of Sunday morning, and then they'll knock something over. They'll knock over a paraffin stove, they'll knock over a candle, etc. So whenever we've discussed, we've walked in communities, they, everyone says, on the weekends, particularly on Saturday nights, everyone's on edge because somewhere there's going to be a fire. And then, of course, there's also other major issues such as health implications related from paraffin fumes. Um, often these, these sort of low income dwellings are very poorly ventilated, causing dizziness and therefore people knock over things um, because they're a little bit, you know, they're, they're struggling to sort of find, figure out their way. Um, but also there's a huge issue about poor knowledge of paraffin safety. Um, in particular with regards to mixing water and paraffin together. As I mentioned earlier, um, residents will often use say coffee mugs or tea mugs, even water bottles to transport paraffin from one neighbor to another. However, it's not very well known amongst people despite an intensive um, social awareness campaign by the city of Cape Town is that even a few droplets of water in a bottle of paraffin can, can change the chemistry, the, the, the composition of the liquid and make it far more explosive, which makes it more, more eligible to ignite, well, not eligible, sorry, that's the wrong word, but it, it increases the fire risk significantly, especially of these um, stoves spluttering, causing these, these outbursts of sparks and flame. But also another major issue that we have in South Africa is that we have this massive illegal market of stoves and fuel, particularly unsafe and cheap models from Southeast Asia, which are, you know, they don't pass the safety standards of South Africa, and maybe they can only be utilized a couple of times before becoming incredibly problematic. So just going on a little bit further on that um, not only are these traditional and transitional uh, fuels fire being problematic towards the fire risk issues, is that there's increasing evidence of dwelling fires caused by electric infrastructure. We find that formal households often provide electricity to their informal dwelling neighbors. So a single house might say provide power for another 10 um, shacks, uh, little wooden structures. And what will happen is that, as you can see in the picture, is that you get these overloading of plug systems, which are in, which cause heat, which indeed cause sparks. Um, another issue that we have in South Africa is that we have um, severe cases of load shedding. And what often happens is that during load shedding, when the power will cut out, is you'll find that um, people will leave their appliances running, technically still on, even though there's no electricity. And then when they go away for work, these appliances will switch back on during the day, such as the electric stove. And then this will be unsupervised for many hours at a time, which could indeed, you know, create a, a situation where maybe sparks, heat will occur. So this is incredibly problematic across the way. And then of course, we're finding that even amongst the, the formerly built dwellings provided by the government is that the, they have faulty electric systems from these 
often very rapidly and very cheaply build homes. So after a couple of years, we we noted that there were a lot of fires in certain communities in which maybe, um, you know, where it was a new residential neighborhood, a formerly developed neighborhood, and suddenly there'll be a, a mass of fires and they were all linked to these uh, probably these very faulty and poor electrical systems. Then, of course, yeah, okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, so just uh, talking a little bit about community resilience is that despite a number of these households having no option but to utilize these um, hazardous energy sources, there are a number of, of unique individual households and communal risk reduction strategies that they employ to try and make to try and make their communities a lot safer. And, and a major aspect of that is, is through community vigilance and mobilization and emergencies where communities will come together to try and put out fires when they occur, to, to watch out for the instance of fires, as well as to, to try and provide relief efforts to those that have been affected. So it's an incredible way that these communities that despite lack of resources and, and these huge risks that they can come together and try and re reduce their risk and reduce their vulnerability. And I think without further ado, because I am out of time, I'd like to wrap up. Thank you very much, Mike, for your time. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, um, Albert. I'm sorry to rush everyone, but I want to make sure we have time for discussion at the end. And I know we started a few minutes late, but I appreciate you trying to keep on time. And that was great to to bring in the energy and and how and and some of the links to the disasters. And I think it ties into Francesca's uh, issues of of urban water security and and then the energy security. I'm sure there are parallels in Uganda as well. So our final speaker today is um, Professor Catalina Spataru, who um, also works on energy resources as a focus. She's the founder and head of the University College of London's Island Laboratory uh, that looks at island nations. And she's also the deputy director of the University of College London Energy Institute. Most notably, um, she's also the lead on the Belmont Forum project, We Energize DR3, which I'm sure she'll talk about. She's written a couple of books on energy systems and island nations energy. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Catalina for 15 minutes. Thank you. you we can see your slides, you're good. You just unmute. Okay. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much for the introduction. Right. So today I'm going to talk about um, the Nexus and DR3, which is coming from disaster risk reduction resilience linkages and the importance to governance to achieve uh, sustainable development goals. Um, so currently I'm one of the projects uh, I'm leading is Re-Energize DR3. Re-Energize DR3 is coming, the acronym is, uh, is coming from Re-Energize Disaster Risk Reduction Resilience for Sustainability. The team is formed from um, researchers from seven countries and various institutions. Uh, the funding comes via Belmont Forum uh, from four funding international agencies, and we focus on two types of case studies, coastal cities and islands. And the main activities um, we cover is research knowledge and knowledge generation, stakeholders processes, and engagement, capacity building and training, and global engagement and advocacy. We are also supporting by various institutions um, across the globe. Uh, so why governance of DR3 and particularly floods, heat waves and droughts? Uh, the number of weather related hazards such as droughts, floods and heat waves has tripled and their frequency and intensity uh, are expected also to continue increasing, adding really greater pressure on resource availability and these risks are amplified by, by the climate variability and change and made uh, more complex uh, by changing patterns of human activities. So we have already seen that almost 2.4 billion people were affected by floods only between 1994 and 2013. Um, and looking at the number of disasters per income group, most vulnerable usually get the burden. So what we are doing part of this uh, project is uh, we address the simultaneous interaction between the climate related natural disasters and development for effective disaster risk management, acknowledging the role of legal principles and institutions in reducing the asymmetries in knowledge and power within a society and uh, emphasize on the need for a normative institutional approach involving diverse stakeholders 
and the ponderation of legal principles supported by the nexus informed methodological approach and uh, tools and use uh, we use a combination of approaches based on artificial intelligence machine learning and dynamic systems so the different methods utilized across consortium partners uh, as you see here in this uh, diagram I put together, uh, inform and support each other. And the final product will be um, a toolbox through a novel combination of quantitative and qualitative methods and the dentological approach. So the toolbox will consist in uh, diagnosis and stakeholders processes uh, on social media and data processing, on resource nexus and climate uh, change modeling scenarios and application to case studies um, and continuous interaction with stakeholders. And uh, we built up a number of strategies which could be defined based on the stakeholders input. Um, as a case studies, we start first with Accra in Ghana, with, uh, which is the coastal cities and with um, island of Mauritius. And then we expand to other case studies. At UCL, what we are doing is we are looking at this Nexus DR3 on a new kind of mission for adaptive governance to achieve the SDGs goals. So what we do is we took the resource Nexus concept and bringing together with the DR3. So the resource Nexus originates in the interconnections between resources, for example, from the requirement of one resource as an input to produce another or from society of two or more resources. And so what we, we really uh, address is an integrated uh, approach uh, to assess the interlinkages between two or more natural resources used as an inputs uh, in social economic systems uh, to enable um, to overcome the seal of, uh, side of thinking. And we involve a number of uh, actors, um, infrastructure planning units, units of water, energy, land, food materials and energy and uh, with the help of different organizations and stakeholders we try to um, assess a number of scenarios and case studies the purpose of this research is really to understand the trade-offs between the resource use and resource allocation in case of a disaster however there are so many challenges underpinning the nexus uh, research when dealing with multiple resources and several limitations in terms of detailed modeling of each system. So in, in uh, more general terms, uh, we have resources which serves as a direct or functional inputs in the production processes um, of another resource or they can substitute of the use of another resource. So all these indirect effects also have to be taken into account and claims for one resource can compete with other uh, useful demands um, such as the case of uh, land use either for the production of food or for bioenergy so all this environment dimension of a resource nexus um, stems from the uh, geochemical ecological con conditions as well as from their social technological and economic political context so all these dimensions are interviewed at many levels of the social, economic, and ecological systems. So one of the conclusions was that modeling across the special and temporal scales raises the issues of long-term um, compatible action in the short run. So this is really crucial when it comes to resource use schedules and environmental, uh, considering the intergenerational equity issues and bringing uh, most affected into the scheme. Uh, the main interdependent interdependencies are uh, we consider are the changes in water availability, the water demand due to changes in climate conditions, um, refining and production processes, energy for water uh, pumping, the food production, transport, land use for biofuels and renewable energy technologies for agriculture, um, also include materials embedded in the energy in the low carbon technologies and needed for the water uh, sector, like the extraction, desalination and pumping. Um, so all these interlinkages between resource use, such as changes in water availability or growing um, competition between sectors are, are um, uh, captured. Um, and that is done through the stakeholders engagement processes. 
and acknowledging all these resource uh, the, the, uh, interlinkages between the resources and the resource nexus concept really provides a more integrated view, allowing us in uh, to better understand the resource related questions that will be difficult to answer in more traditional approach to respond and support the governance of disasters. So what we do is we input various data into the model and look at the trade-offs between the systems. And this is an animation of a model showing the optimized systems operated with different weather conditions. We can include various scenarios um, and each component is associated with different cost and risk and driven by different policy choices. So the local feasibility of any proposed scenario can be assessed while respecting the system's interconnections. The importance of each of the parameters, whether it's land, water, financial, energy, or carbon, varies from one region to another, and those needs to be adapted um, in all the scenarios. So in order to identify any exceeded local limits, the resources indices are also calculated and in each index comprises the fraction of acceptable amount of resources which could be consumed by the proposed scenarios you can define. Um, a key aspect um, in, in, uh, in the work we are doing is to utilize, um, to, to look at the resource allocations. And for that reason, we consider the resource nexus by um, considering a number of services and storage, the induced technologies and failures modes. And radar model uh, is, we, we uh, developed to utilize it to assess the impact of climate change on resource use and allocation considering um, different objectives, um, including risk resilience and security, but also include instruments like planning or investments or different regulations. Um, and also we include measures in terms of resource management or efficiency or even behavior. So what we do is we created like a hierarchy of importance for services, which can be constructed as core services, which it is immediately dangerous to interrupt, such as water and food supply. Then emergency services, health, fire, police, uh, um, domestic lighting, heating and cooling. Then we have the intermediate um, importance and lower importance, um, which includes uh, provision of social services and uh, short um, lived essentials, commodities. And then we have a lower importance, um, long lived and in essentials commodities like holidays or travel and so on. So we really combine services, sources, distribution links, um, stores, each with different social and economic values. And the governance of the DR3 depends on a number of factors, including services and the resources and the optimal integration in a synergistic way to increase community resilience under different scenarios. We engage with stakeholders in coastal cities and islands to validate tools, our tools and to provide inputs uh, on the indicator scorecard, on the governance gaps and approaches, on the resource nexus and allocation, implementation into the R3 governance for effective um, implementation of the SDGs. Um, so we do this with stakeholders selected based on uh, power legitimacy and urgency. And uh, we combine the approach based on policy delphi and Q methods and uh, other methods which we bring together. Uh, so really every single tool we develop or every single model we have and so on is through validation with stakeholders and engagement, direct engagement with stakeholders and through a series of workshops, household surveys and all sorts of other activities included, which different partners are working on. Some of the key conclusions which I want to draw here is equitable DR3. It really involves complex data processes and stakeholders engagement across governance levels. And it really needs a holistic approach, including different methods and techniques. 
and um, this is where our team is doing is bringing st strengths and knowledge from different areas. The Nexus DR3 approach could help address the risk of uh, transgressing critical thresholds across scales and from local society boundaries to planetary boundaries. Uh, stakeholders engagement is critical for validations of models, tools, adaptation and innovation, but also implementation into the ground. Uh, governments are missing methodologies and metrics in this moment to identify the critical functions, systems and assets that should be really prioritized for investments in, in building resilience to the systems. And, and Nexus uh, DR3 adoption should be a necessary condition for development and advancing the SDGs, climate change and Sendai framework and also to unify all of them into a more uh, collaborative way. Um, I also included here a number of relevant publication we've been doing in terms of um, work for West African countries and resource nexus and the governance. So do please get in touch if you need any further information. Thank you, Michael. Oh, thank you, Catalina. It was right on time and appreciate everyone's papers and talks. And um, Carolina was good to bring in the sort of the global modeling perspective, but also bring it down to the local level. So, so thinking, you know, and, and you, you made the point that the interaction between these in this SDG context is critical and we'd like to see more government engagement and also at all levels um, of using this nexus thinking, especially in the context of disaster. So we've seen a a number of examples this this um, session and so we have about 10 minutes or so for discussion and um, I think uh, please post your questions to the Q&A and I see a couple already um, Francesco you asked a couple of questions and I think I'll combine them and if you can keep your your answers brief that'll be great one was the issue of local ownership and the you mentioned that as a, as a plus, but also has its challenges. Can you address that? And also the question on costs and sustainability of these water tanks. Yeah. Um, okay. On the local ownership question, um, I think there's sort of there's two camps. Uh, some uh, water professionals think the goal should be to connect everyone to centralized water. Uh, I think that should be the goal, but I think the realities are that we will not find that in our lifetimes. So um, decentralized solutions are essential. One of the trade-offs you have with community ownership of rainwater harvesting is a benefit is you have e equitable access. So some of the poorer um, members of the communities that I was working in had access to water when they wouldn't otherwise. But we definitely saw in some of the results, uh, the issue was that the maintenance of the collectively owned rainwater harvesting systems was much poorer than the individual tanks. And I think, uh, you know, obviously we know about the implementation of water committees to maintain uh, water systems. Uh, it, it is beneficial, but uh, I, I think by and large, if you can afford and if subsidies are available to have um, individual uh, harvesting systems on the homes, the long-term sustainability of those is, is much more likely to be ensured. Um, and then just going on to the question about the costs. So a cost benefit and an analysis showed that Yes, there's a high capital cost for rainwater harvesting, but over a 10 year period, it's it's equivalent, even in the poorer rural communities where people were actually buying um, you know, water in uh, um, like jerry cans by the litre, because the issue is, is when you buy water in small volumes, it's incredibly expensive. So it's actually as a ratio of income, the poorest who are paying the most. Whereas if you rainwater harvest, you pay one cost and then it's totally free over a long period of time. So it really is all about trade offs, you know, and, and, and looking at things from a holistic point of view. Yes, trade-offs has come up a lot and it's central mm -hmm. to the Nexus thinking. Okay, um, Arthur, you, you got a, a tough question here. You know, when you brought up the Nile and the Gibe 3 dam, um, a colleague in um, Ethiopia wants to, can you, can you look at the trade-offs between the three countries, um, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia in, in a minute or so? <laughs> Oh, well, uh, <laughs> not really. Uh, you know, this is this question uh, has been going on for 50 years. So um, there's so much politics behind that. 
the only thing one can say is, you know, those nations have got to get together and work out some system. The, the, the upper Nile countries have got a right to use water and the downstream countries have also got a right to that water. Their development has been based on that. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a problem which has been going round and round for years. Um, and it's for those countries really to sort it out. That's all I can say. I mean, it's point, you know, uh, what they say is, uh, he who controls the mountains controls the rivers and he who controls the rivers controls the land. And uh, in a way that's what you see because the upcountry people, the upland countries who generate the runoff, um, especially in that part of the world are, are now wanting to use those water resources for their own benefit, which is quite a legitimate um, approach. But you've got to look after the people downstream as well. That's so. Yes, um, it's it's a it's a very tricky political situation. Okay, thanks, Catalina. Um, you know, you're doing the modeling, and obviously, one of the things is abstracting it to reality um, and the data limitations. Can you speak a little bit about um, issues with with collecting data and at different scales? Absolutely. So data limitation is a really huge issue to be honest and one of the biggest barrier in terms of the modeling. Um, it's really important to um, collaborate with, um, with, with colleagues and um, people based on those locations because they will be the best to tell you exactly where you can find those data, who you can contact with, uh, how to get to those data, plus that the engagement with stakeholders is absolutely crucial in any, any modeling or any work you are doing, because otherwise you don't validate your tools, you, you just create some scenarios which are completely out of reality. So this is what we are doing in, in collaborate very closely with, um, with colleagues uh, from uh, Accra in Ghana, with colleagues from Mauritius, from Fiji, from Rio in Brazil, and really through several case studies to understand the issues and to see how we can build up better tools to provide the better indication of of the future and, and to understand these trade-offs between the resource use and value location in case of, uh, of more extreme weather events. Yeah, thanks. So you, we've, we've talked about climate quite a bit um, as, as, as compounding some of these disasters, but we haven't really talked about COVID as I alluded to the beginning, you know, these smaller local disasters can lead to regional and even global significance. So, I'll kind of open it up. Does anyone want to comment on their particular case studies in the context of, of um, solutions where we have compounding disaster issues impacting water, energy, and food? I, I, yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, we, there are many difficulties in, um, because the data during the COVID looks slightly different comparing with the um, historical data we, we have. So um, yeah, we somehow in the scenarios you create, you need to count on how we are counting on this type of events like COVID or our economic events we've seen already in the past. Um, it's really hard to be honest in these models. Um, and if we look at the models, the past um, predictions for the future, uh, you can see a discrepancy for periods when we've seen something happening. So for example, if you look at the global models and we have been doing this type of exercise, you see a, a discrepancy between scenarios in for the period of 2008, 2009. 
So we, I'm sure that once the data will be available and so on for COVID, we can see also lots of discrepancy, discrepancies in future scenarios for, for 2019, 2020. So it's really, really difficult. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that if someone will find this uh, kind of solution in models to do perfect predictions, then uh, we'll be a millionaire or even a billionaire. <laughs> no, so yeah, it's really, really hard. Anyone else want to comment? All right, Francesca, there's another question for you about scaling up these um, rainwater harvesting tanks to for irrigation and things like that at a larger scale. Yeah, um, so that's a really good question. Um, there's there's quite a few research projects that looked at this, and it, it's basically about the technicality. So um, there's there's a couple of options for really large scale water storage. The the, the issue is always the storage. So um, you have several buildings with significant catchment areas, and it's quite cheap to make out of uh, corrugated iron, large catchment area roofs. But the issue is um, getting the storage to store all the water, because you see certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, you have very short, very intense periods of rainfall. And what you want to do is make sure all of that's captured, because actually, if you have a tank that's too small, the overflow can, can actually, in certain cases, destroy crops. Um, so you've got two options. You can do underground storage through, with ferrous cement tanks, which is quite expensive, but very, very effective. And if it's underground, if it's stored underground and protected, it means that you often don't even need to chlorinate the water. The quality is, is fine. And, and for irrigation, you shouldn't be chlorinating it anyway. But for drinking, the quality is fine without chlorination. Um, and the other is, uh, which is much cheaper, is you can store using large, large scale um, kind of plastic tanks, uh, which have tarpaulin covering them. It's much, much cheaper and you can get significant volume. But then again, coming back to the topic of trade-offs, there's much more subject to contamination. And so the quality is less good. Uh, obviously for agriculture um, and irrigation, the quality is left, less of an issue. So I've seen cases of that, you know, we have storage tanks of uh, up to 100,000 litres that you can store in one go, which is phenomenal. And then you just need uh, access to solar or electricity to pump the water for irrigation, which is, is possible in most of the areas that I've worked in. Great. Well, we've come to the end of, of the time, and I appreciate all four of you for your excellent presentations to have us thinking about these water energy food linkages, especially in the context of disasters and the work you've been involved in. I think there's a lot more we can discuss about this, but hopefully there's been some food for thought for those practitioners and, 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 and people who are trying to think about risk reduction and disaster resilience. Um, I'm just going to share my screen for a minute, if you don't mind, uh, to just to talk about upcoming webinars. And uh, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to have them monthly. So this was the first one. The next one, we're going to have them on Tuesdays at the same time. The next one is going to be on governance related issues and institutionalization and cooperation. And that's going to be led by GIZ Nexus Dialogues and their platform. Then in November, we're gonna have a session led by the United Nations University on one of the most interesting technologies related to integrating water energy food, which is agrophotovoltaics, um, focused on West Africa. And then in December, we're gonna have one led by Water Energy for Food group on financing issues related to these solutions. And that's, that's it for the rest of the year. But We'd like to hear your ideas and please email us um, for session ideas. I noticed there was a comment about saline groundwater and how we can um, reclaim that. And we are planning a, a session on groundwater next year. So those are the type of things we wanna hear about um, from you and, and any thoughts for improving these webinars. So with that, I'm gonna um, stop stop talking and I'm ask, gonna ask Domitil or Madison if they wanna say something finally, otherwise we'll close the session. I think uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers and um, for the very interesting, I think the time was short to just go in details and have a full uh, discussion session. So I think that's one of uh, the lessons learned on uh, for the future webinar, but uh, thanks a lot. I think it just covered a wide range of, uh, of issues and topics. And we look forward to the next set of session that uh, that you just are um, organizing. So uh, we welcome all the participants in the future and we'll make sure next time we'll 
set uh, our translation system early so that we don't have the same issue we had today. So I wish you a very good day to all. Bonne journée yeah, à tout le monde. And thanks to the participants, obviously, and have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.